Welcome back to the Wolverine.com podcast, the video edition. I'm John Borton, and today we have a very special guest with us, author, longtime uh, Michigan historian, Barry Gallagher, who has joined us to talk about his book that is out now. And uh, I've got a copy of that, The Nasty Football History of Michigan, Michigan State. You can see the state divide. You can see Paul Bunyan on the cover. Barry, great to have you with us. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. Well, I'll tell you what, I've been uh, I've been going through the book and uh, finding a ton of interesting aspects to it. Uh, why don't you tell me, first of all, before I get into this, how it was that you came to be interested in diving into a Michigan, Michigan State book, one that I will say right up front has uh, breakdowns of every game between these teams uh, from 1898 to uh, through 2020, which is uh, fascinating for anyone closely following the rivalry. Well, I don't know if you know this, John, but I, you know, you know, I'm a, I'm a Wolverine through and through. I don't have a degree from Michigan, but I did teach ROTC there for four years. And I was a fan before I got there. I'll be a fan till I die. But I live in a house divided. Uh huh. So my wife is, you know, I, she hasn't read any of my football books. Okay. <laughs> but she's supportive. And uh, she said one time, she said, honey, how hard would it be to write a book about Michigan State? And I said, well, I think it would be very hard because, number one, I'm not a great Spartan fan, although I have two sons that are Spartans. So, I, you know, I'm okay with Sparty when they're playing, except when they're playing Michigan. Uh huh. But I said the research would really be hard because the information available at the Bentley Historical Library is unmatched. And I said, I just don't think the research, it would be really hard. But I, I started thinking, oh, maybe I could write a book about the rivalry. And I started doing some research, figuring out, has there ever been a book written about Michigan, Michigan State? And the only thing I could come up with was a compilation of articles from the Lansing State Journal I think it was 25 articles written from some of the early games to maybe 1994, five, where they had just basically published a bunch of articles, put it in a magazine format and called it uh, Backyard Brawl. Mm -hmm. So that kind of got my attention. But then in 2014, I went to the Big Ten uh, luncheon and you were probably there that week for the kickoff for the Big Ten season. And Bill Lamonier, who was an official for many years in the, uh, in the Big Ten, he was retiring after about, I think, 20 years in officiating, maybe, I don't know, 15, 12, 15 in the Big Ten. And the reporters were there interviewing him for, for articles for the next day in the, in the trip, is where I read it. And a guy asked a question. He said, so what's the greatest game you ever officiated as an official? He says, well, I did the national championship game one year. He said, but the biggest one was Michigan-Ohio State in 2006. Michigan lost 42-39. Michigan was number two. Buckeyes were number one. That was the day after Bo died. It was, it was a lot of stuff in that game. But he said, that, that's, that's the greatest rivalry and, and the greatest game I've ever done. And they said, and the guy said, well, that's the most intense rivalry you've ever seen. Huh? And he says, oh, oh, I didn't say that. <laughs> and the guy says, what do you mean? He said, the most intense rivalry I've ever officiated was Michigan, Michigan State. And he said, there was a guy in the front row that was Ohio State writer from Columbus doing something. And he, he was like, ha. How can you say that or something like that? He was offended. But he said, no, you don't understand. He said, Michigan, Michigan State, the action starts sometimes before the game even begins. 
And he says, there are rules in place in the Big Ten now where the officials have to be on the field like 15 minutes earlier because of things that have happened in the past. And he said, every play, there's something going on. And he said, we're in there and they're scuffling and they're grabbing each other and we're pulling them off. He said, that goes on for the entire year of game. He said, it is mentally exhausting. So, so hard to do. He said, Michigan, Ohio State, you know, over the years when I was doing it, there was usually a championship at stake. The coaches, somebody's messing around early and they get a dumb penalty. They're jerking that guy off the field. They're getting in his face and saying, you could lose a game with a dumb penalty. Shape up, play some football. So he said, both games are intense. He says, but it's just a different level of intensity. Yeah. So I just started thinking, oh, wow. I got to explore that a little more. And so I did. So 2014, so I really started getting into it, researching it. And uh, I must say, John, I use your book because you have a lot of stuff in your book. And there's some great snippets that I started looking at. And I think, oh, wow. I went through the book and everything that was Michigan, Michigan State, I highlighted in green. And so I, I, I just learned a lot from your book. And then I read a bunch of other books and I started reading the articles. And the biggest thing was, how do I format it? How do I tell the story without writing war and peace on you know, Michigan, Michigan State? It, served, it turned out to be 360 some pages, but with the pictures and some of the data and stuff, I think it's a comfortable read. And the way I chopped it up, if you're a Michigan State fan, I know Michigan State fans that bought the book. The only thing they read about was the games that Michigan State won. <laughs> I don't want to read that other crap about Michigan beating them all the time, mm-hmm. you know, 5% of the time. But um, so Michigan fans, some of them feel the same way. Like, I'm not reading about Michigan State winning games, but I'll read about Michigan. So that's how it kind of came out. And it's been fun. Um, the biggest thing was I promised my wife and my sons that I would tell a fair story. Right. And I, even though I'm a Michigan fan, I wouldn't, I wouldn't let that, uh, you know, prejudice the the story that I told. So right, right. So in other words, uh, Michigan State fans reading this book could skip large sections from say 1970 through the 90s, uh, when uh, when Bo Schembechler and his successors were in charge. Uh, oh, so. Absolutely, and and the one it, it's even worse than that, John. When you look at uh, the 1920s, Michigan won every single game. They were undefeated in the decade. And they did it again in uh, – Fritz Kreiser did it in eight games because they didn't play twice because of the war years, but undefeated for the whole decade. And the 20s was unbelievable because they outscored Michigan State, Michigan State College by a margin of 307 points to three. They scored one field goal in 10 games. Mm-hmm. And when you look back at that and you think about it, I was scratching my head thinking, wow, they had more coaches, five, than they had points during that decade. Things were rough in uh, yeah. East Lansing at that time. Right. And, and you understand where some of that chip on the shoulder came from but even years and years before that and you write about this was uh university president harry henry tappan uh working to block there being the formation of uh another agro or an agricultural college in the state of michigan uh talk about that a little bit well The original state constitution chartered the University of Michigan, and it made the University of Michigan in charge of all education in the state, not just college education, primary, high school, everything. They were in charge of everything. So people in Ann Arbor, based on the constitution, felt that they owned education in the state. And Tappan was was right in his thought. And when they revised the constitution, they put a thing in that um, one liner, it was like a one liner that said there, because of the agricultural interests were very strong back in the day. 
and they always wanted to have a voice and it was an important voice, you know, and later on the automobile industry, but the, the agriculture interests wanted a little more. And so there was a line in the constitution that said that University of Michigan or a separate uh, agricultural college, blah, blah, blah. I don't remember the exact language, but there was a little bit of an opening there for another institution. And the agricultural interest fought hard, Tappan fought hard, Tappan used every resource that he had. And he, I think it was Professor Fox, he hired a guy who was a renowned, renowned agricultural expert. And he thought this was gonna be the ticket to convince everybody that Michigan was gonna be well, well ahead of everybody with agriculture. And he hired this professor and uh, you know, it's gonna have a department of agriculture, not a university of agriculture. And unfortunately, Professor Fox died about four months later of cholera. And so technically that was the death of Tappan's plan to have an agricultural, uh, strong agricultural control uh, of you know, ed cultural education in the state of Michigan. Fascinating so, history. So they didn't like each other even before they played football. And there right. were many things, be, you know, that caused that. Yeah, yeah. So Michigan gets out to a 22 and one series advantage right out of the gate as, uh, as they're starting this series. That uh, certainly establishes uh, a certain amount of enmity in the part of the Spartans and uh, at that time the Aggies. Uh, talk about the the early part of the series and when it finally began to level out a little bit and become the more competitive uh, rivalry between these teams that we have seen. Well. You know, like I said, from 1898 till 1929, Michigan was way, way out front. And then in the 30s, things changed. And at the end of the decade, Michigan won four. The Aggies uh, slash Spartan, then it was the Spartans. Uh, they won four and they tied two. So, wow, you're thinking, hey, this is finally maybe going to be a rivalry. Unfortunately, Fritz Kreisler came along and he didn't buy into that. You think, you know, they had lost many games and, you know, when they, when they debuted the new helmets and everything, that was, and one thing, you know, I think a lot of people didn't know was the 1938 game was the first game where both teams won a version, wore a version of a winged helmet. And I use the picture of Tom Harmon running against Michigan State. And it's kind of subtle, but if you look at the Michigan State helmets, they had white helmets with a green wing on it. They didn't have the, the lines going back. But Michigan State actually was the first school in the state of Michigan to wear a winged helmet. Of course, the Wolverines were second, and, they, of course, they made it famous. No doubt about it. Uh, so... Um, when 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 it really began to uh, uh, become Michigan State being taken very seriously, obviously you took the, the Michigan took its own dip in the fifties and sixties, and uh, and the Spartans flexed their muscles through that time. That was uh, that was different and rough for Michigan fans at the time, obviously. Well, and they, I think Michigan fans, because of Biggie Munn and Duffy Doherty, really started to experience what it felt like to get beat a lot in the rivalry. And, uh, and Sparty was beating them pretty good. Uh, both decades, the 50s and the 60s, Michigan won two, lost seven, and tied one. So that's in that. 20 years, Sparty was 14, four and two. And that's Sparty's best back-to-back um, -back decades in the rivalry. And Biggie Munn, you know, he used to, he used to play for Fritz Chrysler at Minnesota. He was an All-American player. And then he, 
he was on the staff and then he went to take a job at Syracuse. And when he came back, Fritz did not embrace him. I guess it was maybe a Big Ten meeting or something like that. And Fritz's comment was something like, what are you doing back here? It wasn't like, glad to see you, Biggie, you know? And then he went out and beat him like 55 to seven or 55 to nothing. It was embarrassing. So there was no love lost between those two. And Biggie Munn had a chip on his shoulder uh, the whole time he was there. And then he yeah. became athletic director like uh, Chrysler was. So he really raised the level of intensity in East Lansing. And I think it had an effect. I mean, he really, really pushed hard uh, in everything, but especially in football. And, uh, and you know, it, it made a big difference. Yeah. But they also, they also had a model, you know, um, Biggie knew how good Michigan was. He knew how their program ran. He knew the kind of resources and the kind of effort that had to happen to make it be that, that good. And so he, he just basically built a version of, you know, his version of Michigan football in East Lansing. Right. And it worked pretty good. Yeah. My, uh, my good friend and uh, iconic Michigan offensive line coach, Jerry Hanlon, never fails to mention the fact that uh, that crew that came up from Ohio to take over with Bo Schembechler in 1969 found out very quickly the importance not just of beating the Buckeyes, which they knew they had to do to win the Big Ten championship, but winning your game in-state against the in-state rivals and how they heard about it all year long after that 69 game and then, of course, went on a big run against the Spartans after that. Bo goes 17-4. and four. Talk about uh, those early days and, uh, and what happened there. Well, the one thing that struck me about, you know, the first game against Michigan State at uh, East Lansing, Duffy, his he had injured receivers, multiple injured receivers, so he didn't really have a passing game. And he had, he had multiple injuries in the backfield. He basically had a quarterback and he had the runner. And he changed his offense, completely changed his offense the week before the Michigan game so that all the scouting that the Wolverines had done was out the window. And it was like a magic trick. Now, how do you change your offense in a week? That that takes, number one, it takes guts. But number two, um, it was just completely like the Trojan horse for Michigan trying to defend that. And Highsmith was a guy that carried a bunch of times. And the quarterback, can't remember his name, but those two guys basically beat Michigan. And they they just went and punched him in the mouth, starting and just kept punching him in the mouth. And Michigan just didn't have a, a good plan. They made some adjustments. Bo was always good with his staff, always made adjustments, but they just couldn't figure it out. And uh, boom. And apparently the Monday after that game, that's when Bo said, Gentlemen, we now have two teams we have to beat. <laughs> yep. And I'm sure Jerry Hanlon, <laughs> he never forgot that because that was an amazing uh, first game. Yep. So I then know. after that, in the 70s, 9-1. and one. They were 9-1. Yep. And, one. and, and then the they slowed down a little bit. They were only 8-2 <laughs> in, the, in the 80s. But 17-3 yep. and three the last 20 games. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Um, obviously, you you certainly write about that uh, 2001 contest, the Spartan Bob game, uh, just the fact that uh, modern Michigan fans will will not soon forget what took place, what transpired, what uh, the late Frank Beckman described as criminal and everything else. <laughs> Up in East Lansing. Yeah, that was, you know, that was just one of those games where you, you see the replays on the uh, on the Big Ten Network, and you you just you just think, how could that happen? And 
Well, it was in East Lansing. If the same thing would have been in, you know, a few years earlier, number one versus no one, that didn't happen. You know, we couldn't stop them on that one play. And, you know, it all came down to one play. They made the play. We didn't stop it. Boom. But in this case, they, they, they had the extra time. They took advantage of it. And there's now a rule in the Big Ten because of Michigan, Michigan State, that mm -hmm. the timing on the field is kept by an official. Right. But apparently, Bill Lamonier, I, I asked him about that. And I said, take me back to that. And he says, oh, no, you know, you know what happened? And he says, you know, suppose he says the next game. He says, the next time I officiated a game in East Lansing, they were still hot about that because they felt that, you know, they did everything right and then they, they changed the rule anyways. And so the official on the field was having trouble with the clock or something. And guess who was up in the, in this, you know, in the press box, wherever he sat, doing clock for Michigan State, uh, Spartan Bob. And he really wasn't helpful to the Big Ten official who was trying to figure things out. So, yeah, they changed the rule. Uh, the hard feelings will always exist. And, you know, Wolverine fans will say, you know, that's one that, that was unfairly taken from us. And, of course, Spartans will just say, quit your whining. Yeah, of course they will. And but but usually not acknowledge the fact that uh, that that it, it certainly got people's attention because it caused a rule change for the entire league. So uh, yeah. it, it's it was something of great import. You talk about bad feelings; those feelings ramped up on the Michigan side of things in uh, in the last couple of decades uh, because of. Uh, the advent of Mark D'Antonio and uh, the success that his teams had, not only just beating Michigan, but beating them up at times. Um, and, you know, wh whereas Michigan is uh, just under 500 under Jim Harbaugh, they still haven't gotten back to uh, the, the dominance that saw them for four decades win three out of every four games against the Spartans. Right. You know, uh, D'Antonio had been an assistant in East Lansing, so he, he knew what the rivalry was all about. And he brought, you know, he brought a chip and an edge that nobody had had in a while. And uh, like I said, that's what Biggie Munn had when he first started. And D'Antonio, I think, he amped that up quite a bit. And... Uh, I don't know. You, I know you remember this, but the first game of the uh, 2008 season, which was just the first season for D'Antonio, that's when uh, – no, 2007 was his first season, but it was Carr's last season. And App State beat Michigan in Ann Arbor. Right. And that's when he said he hadn't even, he hadn't even coached a game yet against Michigan and he said, Oh yeah, well let's let's have a moment of silence <laughs> for Michigan. And, oh my gosh. So I I'm sure Mike Hart heard about that. And then when uh Michigan went up there and beat him, uh that's when he did his little brother thing and and then you know in the press conference uh, D'Antonio's got steam coming out of his ears and out of his nostrils because again only one game and they had that game, and Michigan came back, and Henny and the boys, they did a great job. And uh, welcome to the rivalry, Mark D'Antonio. Yeah, and uh, when I talk to modern-day uh, Michigan former players that, uh, that were used to that success against the Spartans, uh, they say these guys still have to figure it out. They still have to figure out, Michigan guys have to figure out to bring to the table the uh, the level of emotion that uh, that the Spartans do. Do you buy into that uh, as far as, you know, what's, what's happened recently? Well, I think what's happened recently, Mel Tucker, once again, that guy, he makes D'Antonio look like a choir boy to me. That dude is intense, mm. and he never smiles except the only time I saw him smile last year 
was when they beat Michigan finally at the end of the game. But he takes it serious every play. He makes sure his players take it serious every play. And they're going to bet the farm when they have to to beat Michigan because that's what it means. And so, you know, look at the plays they made in that game to win, and you know, and, and look at the calls that we didn't get. You know, if uh, Hutchison caused the fumble and it was a job both covered it in the end zone, it should have been a touchdown or maybe vice versa. But that was a touchdown that we should have had late in the, late in the first half. And right. uh, they, you know, I, I still don't, they don't show the replays a lot on that one. I think the Big Ten, I think they, they said they admitted mistakes were made, right? Was that the terminology? Yeah, yeah. Uh, not we made mistakes, but mistakes were made. Right. So, so another one of those games where, you know, you just, okay, fine, you know. Yeah. We well, just Barry Gallagher, we, we, we have enjoyed having you on the podcast. Here is the book, again, The Nasty Football History of Michigan versus Michigan State. Tell us about where people can get their hands on this and, uh, and any other uh, final words you have to say about uh, what you have put together here. Well, John, the book is available at Amazon, of course, and it's also available at the MDEN. It's available at a, in, in Flint in a place called the Split Mitt, which is a fun place. You go in there and they got, you know, Michigan State stuff on one side, Michigan stuff on the other. Schuler Books in uh, Lansing or East Lansing and uh, Grand Rapids also have it. And there's a place called Alumni Hall for any uh, – Michigan fans that don't want to drive all the way down to uh, Ann Arbor, they can get it at uh, Alumni Hall, which is uh, a little north of town at uh, the strip mall. Um, but yeah, it's been a fun thing. And of course, it got me fired up. And I told you the other day that I learned a lot about the rivalry. I learned things that I, I mean, I've been a fan a long time and I thought I knew some things, but I had no idea the depth and the breadth and the, the length of the, the hatred and how far it goes back for Michigan, Michigan State. And so I basically have half the book researched already. And so I'm, I'm, I'm just finishing up 1959 and I'm going to write the complete history of Michigan, Ohio State. Because there's a couple books out there that take it to 87, 1987. Well, a few things have happened since 1987. Unfortunately, not all of them that good. I haven't got that point yet, but that's going to be painful to do that research. But uh, and there's another one that's out there that uh, Jack Park from Ohio State wrote one in 2002. And it was not just a history of uh Michigan Ohio State, but it's got a lot of stuff in there. It's the history of Ohio State football. It's like that is war and peace on Ohio State football. And again, it's way more than I want to know about Ohio State. But again, the rivalry is so great. And it's, you know, I think it's the greatest one in college sports. And uh, when you can just say the game and everybody knows what you're talking about, and anybody's got a clue about football, um, that's keeping me busy right now. So, you know. It's, it's fun. I enjoy the research. I enjoy studying history. And, uh, and of course, I love Michigan football, so it's, it's easy to do. Yep. Well, and then Michigan and Michigan State fans will appreciate the research you've done on this. I think you did uh, uh, an even-handed job, as you alluded to, in putting this together, the nasty football history of Michigan versus Michigan State. Uh, subtitled "Why Every Game Drew Blood from 19 or 1898 to 2020." Uh, go get yourself a copy, uh, folks listening in. And uh, once again, Barry, thanks for being our guest on the Wolverine.com podcast. We uh, have appreciated your work in the past, and will continue to do so. Thank you, John. Go Blue.